Hi everyone, my name is Mariana Cabogaira and I'll be talking a little bit about myself and not about my career uh, in this YouTube episode. So, I am an architectural designer at uh, Hadid Architects. I'm also a software tutor uh, at the DRL, so Design Research Laboratory. Uh, and then I became a software tutor live online, so a bit more worldwide. Uh, I'm Portuguese. I did my first graduation and master in Portugal, in Lisbon. And then I also studied in Milan and I moved to London um, to a very specific course called Design Research Laboratory, so DRL. Uh, DRL from the AA, so Architectural Association. And the reason why I did the second master's was because I was not just an architect, I was uh, also a designer and I was very design driven. And in my school, design was not really taught or um, most importantly, I did not have the tools or the skills to achieve design in architecture. And that was one of the reasons why I left to um, and did the second master outside. Design Research Laboratory is a very important course. It was very important in my life. It was actually a shift in my life. Uh, it was two years basically um, evolving and revolving about current architecture and current technology in architecture, current practices, current tools. And it was two very intense years of my life after I did um, DRL. I joined Zaha, um, I joined Zaha in Architects. Now with the tools that were necessary to actually um, achieve design in architecture, which was something that I always believed in. Uh, so I joined Zaha to a very specific cluster, and when I say cluster, I mean a very specific department in architecture. It was called, and it's called the Zaha cluster. It's a cluster that is basically done for commissions and competitions, but the base is to kind of break the boundaries of design and of current design, basically in everything that you do from that cluster. So I joined that cluster and I've been working there for five years now as a senior architectural designer. So that's basically uh, what I do. And then at some point I realized that the software that we were running, not at some point actually, right in the beginning, I realized that the software that we were running, my from Autodesk, was a software that was not very known outside. It was part of the Zaha Hadid Architects DNA. Um, to be very honest with you, the tool has a very big input on the design um, qualities in the end. So um, it's also a software that is not very spread across and the knowledge is not very spread across. So I decided to teach this software outside in a way to kind of bring more qualified people and also to uh, increase the chances of these students to join offices like Zaha did architect. So that was a bit of the goal. So I decided to be teacher of Maya back at the DRL. So I went back to teach there and I teach there for, uh, let's say, three non-official years and then two official years. And, and then I left the DRL and I started teaching life uh, to a broader community. So as you know, in the past last, last years, uh, everything that is happening um, online and through social media has been very important, especially academia ways. And there was this mega uh, movement of uh, virtual academia platforms. I was part of that as the Maya tutor and I'm proudly par a part of that actually. And uh, it's a lot of fun. I'm still teaching live um, on my weekends and uh, a specific, this specific software that kind of allows you to reach that kind of architecture. And, um, and to also give you gives you a shot to join other offices that do that kind of architecture. So that's what I do. Okay, I am a senior architectural designer at Zaha, and I also do my own project outside with my own freedom uh, to teach them or not, uh, but to just get a bit of media uh, release as well. Okay, so my current focus is very simple. So on one side, I'm doing the Tower C. So Tower C is a project for that um, I was involved in uh, the competition last year, two years ago uh, from Zaha. I designed them with a lot of friends from Zaha, of course. It was good times <laughs> and then it became hard times, um, just like a new project, but we won the project. It was a competition. And then I got involved with the team that is um, kind of, let's say, uh, responsible for the completion, okay, for the construction of the tower, a mega team. 
uh, from London and Beijing. So Tower C is a project in Shenzhen and I am working on it since, I don't know, a year and something. And it will probably be done in two years and final completion is 2025. Uh, which is very interesting to see, I hope. Beside Tower C, I am doing, like I said, my own designs, my own stuff um, for teaching, of course, with uh, no, no other profit than teaching and for media release, which is something that I find increasingly very important, uh, as you know from my Instagram. Uh, sounds not that important, but it's probably bigger than your portfolio. So that's something that I do. I develop my own projects and I work for Tower C. That's my work focus. About parametric architecture and generative design. So um, both was something that I learned um, during the years that I was at the DRL. Of course, not in Portugal. And uh, I'm being mean. <laughs> but um, basically, Patrick um, coined the idea of parametric uh, design, of parametric architecture. Uh, it's a very funny subject. I do think that 90% of us do not know what parametric is and the other 10% who knows what parametric is knows that I do not do parametric architecture and it's very obvious from my designs that it's not parametric architecture but in a way we kind of tied aesthetics and a very specific the high aesthetics to parametric architecture that is wrong and uh, it's uh, even slightly superficial but parametric became a trend. It became a fashion that no one really knows what it means, but it's easier for them to give a name to aesthetics, to a specific aesthetics. And the people who knows what it means knows that it's being applied wrong. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's basically what parametric uh, became. So I was um, using it during the DRL. So uh, basically applying parameters uh, in architecture in order to create um, iterations and that that's when generative design comes. So I was applying specific parameters to achieve a very specific architecture, uh, very specific optimized architecture, let's say. Uh, and then I started doing a lot of Maya and actually uh, the final product of design research laboratory was Maya, it was not parametric, it was free modeling, hand modeling, I mean, you can still use a bit of parameters of Maya inside of the modeling, um, but it's optional and you don't always need to use them. Um, you can say that either everything is parametric or has been parametric because we do you use parameters since the beginning of times <laughs> or nothing is parametric, basically. Um, I use a bit of both. I hybridize them in these days. And that's when I got in touch with them with the DRL and then I joined the Zaha and it's also a bit like that. So sometimes you do parametrics, sometimes you don't do parametrics. Uh, Maya is not called, um, it's not to be a parametric uh, software and uh, not all work that you see that has Zaha aesthetics is parametric architecture. But um, I think that's just semantics. About generative design. Uh, generative design has I have two, uh, two opinions about generative design. I have a lot of opinions about generative design, but I think that generative design can be used in two different things. Uh, there is generative architecture, and usually generative architecture is interesting to develop iterations that optimize uh, architecture. They either optimize time, they optimize construction, they optimize, I don't know, materials. That's when generative architecture becomes very interesting. Also, if you want to create something that evolves, uh, optimize time, especially. If you want to create something that evolves quickly um, in space, like say design, for example, urban design, parametrics architecture will probably, uh, generative architecture will probably help you along with parametric architecture um, to kind of develop uh, let's say, a chain of evolution of, of something. Um, do I find generative architecture important? No, <laughs> I don't think so. Do I find generative design interesting? Super interesting. I think that anyone who does generative, uh, use generative tools should um, 
have fun in architecture, of course, but migrate from architecture and focus on generative design. I do think generative design will have a bigger impacts than it has now on uh, NFTs or NFT markets or even the metaverse. Um, we will be able to experience generative design or generative art in the virtual world. And that is that architecture, I'm not sure. But is it a piece of art? Yeah, definitely. So um, I use generative design and DRL for optimization. And with time, when I joined the office, I obviously stopped doing generative design because it's too unpredictable and it's not very grounded. Um, but I continue watching the way generative design was evolving and especially the way it tied with NFTs right now. And I think that it has a lot of potential for entertainment. And when I say entertainment, I mean art. <laughs> Is this provocative enough? But I think you know what I mean. Um, I would stay on it. If I had skills on it, I would stay on it and I'll probably sell it later or include it on some digital experience, like Metaverse, for example, or NFTs. Uh, so that's how I got in touch with generative uh, design. Uh, it's a lot more simpler than you think. It's like just like your own uh, design process or your own architectural process. It has no magic into it specifically. Um, I start from a brief, from my client's brief or from the office brief. And I think the most important part is to understand, is to strategize your brief, to understand what's the logics and what does the client want. And then at the same time, you are, since you are an architect, you should also bring everything that you know about architecture that should be involved. So it could be either design or it could be culture, it could be the site, it could be sustainable uh, principles. There's a lot of things that we also learn as architects that is not on the brief necessarily. And it's very interesting when you are able to merge them and you feel the responsibility to merge them. So that's how I start. Okay, I start from a brief, I understand the best strategy. And then a uh, second step, that I do immediately is to look for case studies. And when I say case studies, it's um, buildings that are already built and they were facing the same brief or similar brief. And basically from that, from those buildings, you understand what they did that was um, correct or what they did that was successful and what they did that was not that successful. And you kind of bring a little bit of all and you bring your own ideas and kind of hybridize them in what you think that makes more sense. So that's what I do before I start designing. And how do I start designing? Super simple. I, I sketch them. <laughs> like there's no, I don't wait for like the best day or the best weather or the best anything. I just sit down, uh, read the brief um, and start sketching everything that is coming to my mind uh, as I'm reading the brief. I believe that when you're reading your brief for the first time, you start like, um, your intuition starts giving you a lot of tips and a lot of ideas that maybe they are completely disconnected, but they will probably be uh, more genuine or they will have probably they have a, a good message for your for your building. So I grab them always. I sketch them very quickly. They are not artistic. They are not meant for anyone to see or to understand. It's for yourself. And then I just open either my 3D modeling software like Maya and I start um, designing thousands of options. I just design, 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 control D, uh, duplicate, put it on the side, duplicate, put it on the side, duplicate, and then keep doing your changes until um, you fit the right strategy that you think that your building should have. And uh, the building, the city, the people, so <laughs> there's all of, all of these uh, data that you need to kind of fulfill when you're doing architecture. And um, let's say when you are in an office, usually the creative part takes let's not call it creative part, but the generation of a typology and topology um, takes, uh, I don't know, a month until you kind of freeze that and then you start developing your project, like like uh, building it with the program and um, how the function has to kind of mold this design and how this design has to make some sacrifices for the function or um, for technical things as well. So probably a month for designing and designing and being like, I don't know, free in your ideas and your strategies. 
So there's no secret that I use Maya, right? Uh, Maya from Autodesk. It's um, usually I say that it's uh, you have Blender, right? I say Blender is like the SketchUp the, for fluid architecture. It's like a dummy, a dummy software, not very accurate. And then on the other end, you have Rhino that is a little bit more accurate. And I'm talking about 3D modeling. And then you have Rhino that's a bit more accurate and it, it needs a little bit more of uh, measures and you kind of need to know with precision what you're doing and that also constrains design a lot. And then in the middle you have Maya. Okay, so Maya basically is not as constrained as Rhino is and is not as dumb as Blender is. So that's exactly where I work. And then I usually move to Rhino whenever the building needs more accuracy. And when I say accuracy, I mean um, construction, I mean um, rationalization. Okay, that's accuracy. Before that, it's months and months instead of Maya, I could be doing doorknobs. I could be doing, I don't know, window frames in Maya. And then whenever it needs parametrics or whenever it needs to be rationalized, I take it to Rhino and then Grasshopper helps to make it even, Grasshopper is the actual um, parametrics, let's say, tool par excellent. So you can bring Grasshopper sometimes to, to make something more parametric or to bring, a, to rationalize your shape. And then you can go to Revit and then AutoCAD and then that's it, you get your building issued. That's how the tools that I do is usually Maya and Reno. So, um, what inspires me? I'm going to be very honest. Inspiration is still a word that I'm trying to figure out because I think that I have a lot of uh, stimulations from things. So, uh, books can be stimulating, can bring me ideas, uh, traveling can be stimulating, um, some talks with some people can be very stimulating. Um, in the end, what inspires me to be who I am and what inspires me to continue is probably uh, the person that I was when I was younger and when I was putting all the time and all the efforts in this, in architecture, not in just in architecture, but in my ideas and um, the people, the person that I thought I was going to be and the person that I thought I had the potential to be. And that's probably what inspires me the most is, is that little version of me uh, trying and the version of me putting effort and the version of me compromising blindly without knowing at all where I was going to land or if that made any sense or at all. Um, and uh, I did it for a reason that I still don't know, but I did it and it was very a lot of like uh, long hours and years uh, doing my compromise because of my ideas and my principles and I just think that that's probably what inspires me to make the same efforts and the same compromises today. Uh, definitely I think that's my biggest source of inspiration. <laughs> and um, I think that's it, that's it for today's episode. And, I hope you liked it and if you want to reach me out just reach me on my instagram mariana capugaira and um, yeah i'm usually there to reply to all of your questions especially software wise and uh that's it i hope you have a great day bye bye